Great to see so many returning folks from these weekly events, names and faces that I recognize, as well as some newcomers. Um, please open up the chat, uh, introduce yourself over there, let us know where you're joining from. I saw folks from all, really all around the United States, a couple of other countries as well, so great to have you with us. Uh, this was the big week where spring has sprung back on Tuesday. It was a little bit earlier than some years. On the 19th, the spring equinox, that's the day when day and night are, are equal. Um, wouldn't know it from where I'm sitting because we just had fresh snowfall here in Rochester, New York. But hey, spring is spring is springing in most places, at least. Um, we are I4CP, the Institute for Corporate Productivity. We're a human capital research firm. We discover the people practices that drive high performance. Uh, we define high performance by looking at four fairly common business metrics, revenue growth, market share, profitability, and customer satisfaction. And those come into play when we do our major studies and we tease out what HR practices, human capital practices, high performance organizations do more than low performers. We like to tease out what the top quartile do uh, more often than those than the lower quartile and make that comparison and then bring that data to light in all of our research reports, infographics, case studies, and so on. We provide the bulk of that exclusively to our member community, making some available to the broader public, of course. Um, you see here just a small sampling of organizations that are part of I4CP membership, including very large companies like Visa, Amazon, Microsoft, 3M, and others. Uh, really organizations that span across all industry market verticals from healthcare to manufacturing to retail, uh, high tech, you name it. Um, we've also got many global organizations, including increasingly some that are based outside of North America. And we also have a growing cohort of unicorn startup uh, companies that are smaller in size, but but growing fast. Uh, if you're with a member company and on the call today, special welcome to you, of course. Uh, and if you're with an organization that isn't yet a member and would like to learn more, just reach out to us via our website at i4cp.com. The link for that has been put in the chat. Thank you, Zeta. Or, or reach out to any i4cp employee and we'd be happy to have that conversation. My name is Tom Stone. I'm a senior research analyst here at I4CP, and I have the pleasure of hosting most of these Next Practice Weekly sessions. And this week, I'm joined by my colleague, Mimi Turner, our Vice President of Executive Search. Good morning, Mimi. Good to have you. Good morning, Tom. Good to be here. Uh, we'll hear more from you in just a moment, about uh, uh, briefly about your role at I4CP, and then you'll be leading the conversation with our special guest in just a moment. But for now, I want to just walk through a couple of other preliminaries. I want to note that this is Next Practices Weekly, and we do meet every Thursday at the same time, 11 a.m. Eastern, 8 a.m. Pacific. We won't be meeting, however, next week, uh, and you'll learn more about why that is in just a moment. We'll reconvene on April 4th, April 11th, and then April 18th, and you see some of the guests that we'll have on those upcoming calls. We also meet uh, on other days of the week, uh, a bit less frequently uh, and at different times uh, for our APAC and EMEA HR brethren. Uh, so uh, if you've got, if you're a global organization, you've got HR leaders uh, in those areas of the world, please pass this along to them. Um, if you're on the call uh, with a global organization, you can use the QR code or just visit i4cp.com and go to the events section. We've got some upcoming events on April 17th for APAC and May 15th for EMEA. And they're very similar in nature to this one. We'll have local guests that are HR leaders, CHROs, heads of diversity, heads of learning and talent from those regions uh, sharing their best and next practices. The reason we won't be having uh, a call in this series next week is that we are having our annual Next Practices Now conference that, of course, uh, if you've been on these calls, you've heard us uh, promote this week to week. You see here the lineup of outstanding speakers that we've got for this event, which is exclusively for HR leaders. Uh, there's no trade show, there's no expo, uh, no vendors hitting people up in the hallways for, for sales and so on. It's just peer-to-peer -peer learning from folks like you see here on the screen. I recognize that it's perhaps a little late to make last minute travel plans to get to Scottsdale, Arizona. However, there is the opportunity to, to register and attend the sessions virtually. So we want to encourage those that maybe can't make it at this late date in person. If you can, that's great. Uh, you've got a flexible travel schedule, apparently. But if you can't, we, we understand there is a virtual option. Uh, we're going to have 500 folks attending there in person, but many more uh, also attending virtually. So we'd encourage you to check that out at i4cp.com forward slash conference. 
All right. Uh, as I said, I'd like to have Mimi just spend a couple minutes describing her role at I4CP, which is heading up our executive search practice. Thanks, Tom. And I absolutely love this role because um, I play what I can call a glorified matchmaker every day. So Tom, as you mentioned earlier, um, I4CP is the leading authority on next practices and human capital. Right. And to complement this, we have an executive search practice that has a singular dedication to HR leadership. Right. Um, and in partnering with I4CP, companies can also experience some of these recent successes. For example, last year, 100% of our place leaders were defined as diverse for their organizations. 75% right? um, of them um, were women and 75 uh, represent historically under-recognized groups. Um, so for those of you on this call, reach out to me if you or anyone you know is interested in learning more. All right, Thanks. great. Thank you so much, Mimi. Uh, and with that, we're going to bring on our guest today, um, Vice President and Chief Talent Officer at Dick's Sporting Goods. Mimi, I'm going to turn things over to you to lead this conversation. I'm going to be monitoring the chat uh, and watching. Uh, folks, please keep that chat open. That's your opportunity to interact with our guest today. Please make any comments you have, ask any questions, and I'll curate those and uh, come off mute periodically to to throw those Michael's way. But go ahead, Mimi, let's let's get dive in here. All right, thank you, Tom. And it is a pleasure, um, Michael, to have you here. Uh, you have had an impressive career in HR, including leadership roles at Colgate Palmolive, PepsiCo Honeywell, and for the last three years, uh, Dick's Sporting Goods. So please introduce yourself. Tell us a little bit about yourself and your career journey. And also, you know, tell us a little bit about your role as the chief talent officer um, and also, I'm going to add on another one. And for context, how HR is structured at Dick's Sporting Goods. Is that enough for you this morning, Michael? I, it's about all I can handle. I, yeah. I, I'm i not sure if I have enough cups of coffee for that one, but no, uh, I appreciate it. And, and thanks, uh, Mimi and, and Tom, for for inviting me and having me this morning. Um, it's uh, it's a pleasure. It's humbling, actually, to, to, to be asked to do this. And, you know, I'll, I'll say at the, at the outset, it, it always feels like, you know, when something like this it's like bragging but you know what gets me through is the notion that like what i am doing is bragging on the team here which which um as we talk about things will be their you know a reflection of their great work but a little bit a little bit about me um just to kind of let you know who's who's behind that fancy corporate picture you just saw um uh again michael keeneth uh you see on the page there just a little bit about my my family life there, my lovely wife, Tara, we've been married for 19 years. Next year is going to be 20. So um, looking for for great sort of 20th uh, honeymoon ideas. Uh, you can feel free to add them in the chat. Um, uh, my boys, 17, 15 and uh, 11, and, and they're every bit as a handful and precocious as as they, they appear in that picture at the, the Pittsburgh Pirates game. Um, and then, of course, you know, the animals that we've collected over time, we have two Britneys, Cooper and Chloe, and uh, two cats that 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 think they're dogs uh, at this point. Um, you know, and we've moved uh, throughout my career, and I'll talk about that in, in a minute. Uh, you know, this is our eighth move as a family uh, globally through, through the United States. And so um, we, we truly collect things along the way, as you do when you when you move that many times. Um, all, all three of the kids, for example, were born in, in, in different places, one actually overseas. Um, and then on the bottom there, you just, you know, I'm, I'm kind of a, a closet nerd, maybe not so closet if you ask some of my co colleagues, it, it comes out. Um, but but I'm certainly a, a sort of organizational behavior and, and, and psychology nerd. So those are some of my favorites down there. But I'm also, uh, you know, I, 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 like many of you have diverse interests, uh, you know, I'm, a, I'm an Orange Theory workout uh, fanatic. So I've been doing that for for seven plus years. Um, as you heard in the intro, I'm a huge Foo Fighters fan, huge music fan in general, um, musician. Uh, uh, during the pandemic, like most people do, you know, I, I got my black belt in Kung Fu. Um, and, uh, and, and just recently I started, uh, started riding a motorcycle. So, um, so I, I, I try to keep things a little bit interesting. A um, little bit about my my career, uh, just, you know, the way I've kind of looked back, I, I wish I could say it seemed this this neat and tidy on the way forward, um, but did my undergraduate degree at Loyola University in Maryland in psychology. Um, apparently can't get any jobs with an undergraduate degree in psychology, so I went right to Hofstra 
to, to, to uh, receive my uh, master's in industrial organizational psychology. Spent a year internship as part of that program with um, with Evelyn Rogers, E. Uh, Rogers Associates up in Connecticut and uh, was, was uh, sort of like a whole other master's uh, degree doing that and consulting uh, in, the, in the sort of org development talent space. Was lucky enough to join Colgate's at the time global uh, HR rotational program, um, which got me exposure to pretty much every function you could right out of the gates across HR. And then quickly, um, you know, got kind of swept away by the HR business partner uh, work within HR and, and spent the balance of my time at Colgate doing that at, at, at Hills Pet Nutrition, the subsidiary of Colgate, really a formative time, you know, learning, you know, learning how to be an HR business partner, uh, really uh, tremendous. And then moved to, to PepsiCo, um, where, you know, I sort of, I, I joke and tell people, you know, the first six years I spent at PepsiCo, I feel like I did my honorary PhD in the, the OD talent space. And then, you know, the second six, I feel like, you know, uh, at Frito in particular, did my honorary MBA um, and just uh, and just really, really enjoyed that time and, and had a, a great opportunity to support really cool businesses around the around the globe and, and, and across the United States. Spent a, a short stint at, at Honeywell before before landing here at Dix uh, almost three years ago. Um, and, uh, you know, today I, I uh, like you mentioned, lead the talent function here, uh, which uh, which is comprised here, and I know it's it's different in many different places, uh, but uh, that includes uh, diversity, equity, inclusion, um, talent management, org effectiveness, change, um, talent acquisition, L and D, people analytics, uh, labor, employer relations. So it's a uh, uh, it's a it's a really great really great group, and uh, has been a, a great experience here. Yeah, so just a, a little bit, I thought it'd be good just grounding, um, uh, just in case you haven't been to a Dick's Board of Goods, hopefully hopefully you have, um, um, just to give a little bit of a sense of, of the company that we are. Um, there, there are many conversations I have with, with people who, uh, who actually uh, don't realize that the scale and the scope of Dick's Board of Goods. Um, I remember myself growing up and you know, Dick's has been around for 75 years. I didn't have a Dick's Board of Goods near me at the time on Long Island. Now, of course we do. Um, but, um, but yeah, we have, we have 855, uh, doors throughout the United States. Um, and, uh, that's grown tremendously and we continue to grow. We, we plan to open anywhere from 50 to a hundred new doors, uh, over the next, uh, three to five years. Um, you know, we, we just had our earnings, uh, for Q4 and full year 23, uh, last week. And we, we had another great quarter, actually a, a history historic quarter for us as an organization, our stock, um, you know, our stock increased by the largest percentage uh, and dollar amount it ever has in, in the history of exporting goods, um, all for good reason. We, 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 we continue to deliver really strong results. And Tom, you said it earlier, you know, I was thinking through, you said, you know, high performance as defined by revenue, market share, profitability, customer satisfaction. And, you know, um, we're doing okay. We're doing okay on those elements. You know, we, 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 we showed through Q4, two and a, almost two and a half percent comp, comp growth stores. And the good news about that is it's, it's, it's healthy growth, right? Um, it's, it's transactional growth. It's not, it's not necessarily pricing growth. So, um, so we feel, we feel really good. And, and I think, you know, doing, doing the right things as a business. Um, and just to give you a sense of, of scale, you know, where, you know, where we are the largest U S omni-channel sports retailer. Um, but, but we believe have a lot of, a lot of headroom and, and hence the, the, the reason to believe in our, in our growth, um, you know, we we you know say only only eight and a half percent market share, but with a with a hundred and forty billion dollar addressable market in in this space. So um, so good things good things on the horizon for us, but uh, it certainly keeps keeps us busy in the in the talent space for sure in the broader in the broader HR organization. Michael, before we we dive into uh, some of the drivers of all the success, culture, uh, leveraging talent, DE and I uh, at. at, at at Dix, um, I we in our prep call I didn't mention this, but uh, maybe you picked up on it. Uh, I live in Rochester, New York, as I, as I often mention, and we are one of the locations of one of your special stores, mm. uh, where I think it's Dick, I think it's Rochester, maybe Knoxville, Tennessee, or Nashville, Tennessee. You yeah. guys have a couple of uh, maybe expanded now beyond just a couple. 
I felt like they were experimental when they came out, but they're full experience stores where it's not just your typical Dick's retailer selling all the equipment and everything and shoes. Uh, it's that plus uh, we have a we have a turf field we have a, a which turns into a hockey rink during the winter where you can try out the equipment where there's training sessions by the employees bring in coaches entire teams uh, it's really an impressive facility it's part of one of our local malls here um, so just real briefly um, say a little bit about that the, the the thinking behind that yeah absolutely I think that's Victor right that's Victor New York yeah Victor New yeah. York near Rochester. yeah that was actually our first that was our flagship what we call dick's house of sport and um yes. i'm starting to lose count so i'm not going to quote a number um certainly uh, above seven um across the nice. country and, and growing um but these if you think about it like you know these are an amazing experiential brick and mortar retail um uh construct and, and you're right sort of started out as you know sort of you know in a very healthy way right you think about healthy organizations and how they think and innovate like if we were to put, if we were to be put out of business, what would that look like, right? So how do we create that faster than any any competitor could? And 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 that's what it is. It's you know these these are you know roughly one hundred twenty thousand square foot um, boxes that um, have some of the the most amazing visual aesthetic, um, the most amazing top tier product and brands. Um, and then you have the experiences, you have rock climbing walls, you have the batting cage um, with our hit tracks technology, you have our golf hitting bays. Um, uh, and then yes, in, in, in many, if not uh, most of the house of sport locations, we have a field that sits next to the, uh, next to the building where, where we run clinics and team sport uh, events and, and, and in certain locations where it's, where it's certainly cold enough, like Minnetonka, uh, mm -hmm. up in Minnesota and, and Victor for sure. And we have another one up in New York as well uh, near our home, our home town, Binghamton, um, where yes, we roll out the ice, we, we, we roll out the ice and it becomes hockey season out there. On the, on the other. So yeah, they're amazing. And, and part of our, uh, our growth strategy and, and are doing tremendously, tremendously well for us. A couple of weeks after it first opened up here, uh, I, I wanted to shock my 84 year old mother. And so I took her to this, which she didn't know what she was getting into and her she just didn't have words for what she was seeing because she was expecting it just be a you know a 10% larger retail operation but it was some certainly way more than that. All right, enough about that. I'll turn things back over to you Mimi. Thanks. Thanks Tom. Hey, did you take a rock climbing? <laughs> <laughs> she her days of doing anything approaching that are, are well past her i'm afraid what and um i think maybe what we'll do is um advance to the next slide because um michael i'd love to talk a little bit about culture with you right um as you just have shared with us dix has you know seen solid growth and success um recently including that all-time high right um and what originally started as this fishing shop in i think like 1848 or something i have this written down on my note has now grown to more than that 800 stores around the US. And even in the face of major challenges from the pandemic, e-commerce, your competitors, you're still showing that, that growth, right? Um, so few companies have had such success over time without a good culture. So how would you describe the culture at Dix? Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, bait and tackle shop up in Binghamton, New York, Dick Stack. Um, and uh, not in 1848, though, it was 19, 1948. Oh, um, if, if, if Ed, our, his son, were to hear that, he would, you know, thinking that he's, you know, over 100 years old, I think. He, <laughs> um, but, um, but yeah, uh, so we, like I said, we've been around for 75 years in some form or fashion. And, um, and it started very humbly, very small as a bait and tackle shop. You know, it was, it was Ed, Ed Stack's um, father, um, and Ed is now our chief merchant and, and executive uh, chair of the board. Um, uh, you know, Ed's father, Dick, um, essentially borrowed $300 from his grandmother to, you know, and she took the money out of her cookie jar, gave it to him to, to start up his own business. And that's what he did. And that's sort of the, the humble beginnings we, we, we come from. And, um, you know, I, I would say w when I think about the culture here, part of, part of what brought me here, part of what a big part of what keeps me here. And I think a lot of my colleagues is it, it, it really starts with, with what we call our shared belief. Um, and that, that is quite simply sports have the power to change lives. And, you know, if you think about that for a minute, um, 
I, I, you know, if you're like me anyway, um, and I know many of us human beings who grew up um, playing sports um, in some way, shape or form, that's pretty powerful. Um, it's a pretty powerful statement. You know, I think about growing up playing baseball, wanting to be the next shortstop for the New York Yankees and, you know, had every intention <clears throat> to play, you know, into my my old old age. Um, it was a deep, deep passion. And so the, the teams I was part of, the, you know, the, all the time I spent traveling and um, and and building those those formative relationships and the coaches I had and how they shaped me. Right. When you think about that notion of sports have the power to change lives like there's that's that's real. And that sort of forms the foundation of our, our belief as an organization. Next, I'd say, you know, it's it's kind of what we stem from that, which is our common purpose or, you know, kind of our vision, right? To create confidence and excitement by inspiring and supporting, personally equipping all athletes to achieve their dreams. And, you know, as with many companies where, where sometimes that sounds like a very pie in the sky type of statement to achieve their dreams. Well, think about it. You know, you have and I've seen this, you know, working in our stores, you've got that eight year old in the store for the first time with their father trying to get outfitted for their first lacrosse practice ever, right? Uh, or, or, or baseball practice ever. And they're picking their helmet, they're picking their bat. There's a twinkle, there's a dream in the eye of that, of that child, right? And, and so that's kind of what we anchor to, I would tell you, in, in this, this organization. And um, it, it pervades the culture, I would say, first and, first and foremost. So, um, you know, those two things themselves make it really easy to get on get on board with with what's going on around here. Um, and then I would say all of that is manifested and it goes back to what you mentioned, Mimi, around our humble beginnings. It, it, you know, it's two words, humble and hungry. You know, we, we just had a great quarter, a fantastic year. We beat analyst expectations. Um, we're, we're resetting the bar on, you know, whether or not we were just a a COVID darling, or, or we're really truly, you know, fundamentally uh, changing the fundamentals of our business. And we finally started, of, but we're not braggardly. We're not kind of out there, you know, we're, we're, we're quietly going about our business, knowing that we're doing the right things for business. So I would say humility is, is huge. And, you know, we, we, you know, it's like sort of the, the analogy of the duck on the, on the water, right. With really busy legs underneath the surface. Um, and then hungry, you know, we, we are a growth company. And um, it's fast paced, it's retail, it's fun, but, you know, uh, we're, we're hungry to win. And, and I would say that those things together really characterize what it, what it, it means to work here, what it's like to work here. Uh, you, you mentioned uh, being a COVID darling, one of those companies that, that benefited financially for a little bit um, from yeah. lockdowns and things like that because of everyone in your case uh, going, going outdoors. We're using Zoom today. Obviously, they were a COVID darling as well. Um, mm -hmm. We'd like to ask this question related to COVID and the pandemic. Um, how has your organization, for those on the call, how has your organization's culture changed since the onset of the pandemic? We asked this last week. We've asked this, or two weeks ago, I guess it was. We've asked this a few times uh, on this call. I always like to just get a pulse of those on the call. And as folks are chiming in, would love to hear, Michael, how it changed at Dick's. And then we'll, we'll bring up the poll results here in a minute. Yeah, um, I would say it's interesting you know, I joined, I joined the company sort of towards the tail end back in mid 2021, towards the tail end. We still were back in the office physically here in our corporate headquarters in Pittsburgh. Um, so I, I, I wasn't here at the beginning, although obviously uh, I, I, I can speak to it. Know it. The interesting thing is, as you look at our engagement sort of results, as we've, we've done engagement surveys through the time, um, our engagement results actually improved over that time. Um, interestingly enough, you, you kind of scratch your head at that. Um, and, and, but I think it's, it's for a few reasons. Um, you know, we really prioritized our teammates, uh, through, through the pandemic. And, and, you know, I know, I know many companies did like, this was just such an unprecedented thing for everyone that, you know, the, the companies that got it right, let's put it that way. The companies that got it right really knew where to focus their attention and their priority. And, and I think that that is no less true than what happened here at Dix and, and, um, and, and really led through the, the, the sort of leadership of, of, of Ed Stack and, and Lauren Hobart, our CEO, um, you know, and, you know, we prioritize our teammates. And by the way, we call, we call our employees teammates, um, you know, 
when you work for the exporting goods, everything is a sports analogy. So, so, so buckle in. Um, you're about to hear some more, I'm sure. Um, you know, for example, one stance we took, you know, when I talk about um, prioritizing our teammates is during the pandemic, we, we developed our zero, what we call our zero, uh, zero tolerance stance, um, which is sort of a statement that we posted in all of our stores very publicly that essentially said, you know, we we will not accept any form of harassment or discrimination in our stores. And now remember that time, the, the, the tensions were high, you know, there was a lot of sort of, you know, just on edge, right? And and as anyone on the call knows in retail, it was, uh, uh, you're at the front lines, you're truly in the trenches in retail, right? And, and you have to deal with a lot coming in the door. Just by making that statement and standing by our teammates, um, I think meant meant the world, right? It gave gave them something to anchor to as as a support mechanism, knowing that you know your company's got your back. Um, I think it was also extended to way, the way we treated our, our our partners, our corporate partners and and vendors. You know, the the big brands that we work with. You know, we did everything we could to ensure that their businesses. Um, could not only survive but but thrive. You think about all the landlords, all the all of the real real estate we we pay lease rates on, et cetera. Um, you know, we we bent over backwards to make sure that we were um, meeting our commitments through that time um, because we knew we would have to be part of this this ecosystem long long term. Um, even even frankly, when we weren't sure if this business was going to be viable, right? In the early early times, pandemic, everything was down, shut down, right? So yeah. um, you can't run a retail operation when you don't have when you don't have a storefront. Um, um, and then, you know, we did things that um, I think just went above and beyond to show our teammates that we recognize that they're on the front lines. Like, you know, we, we implemented a program called, we called Hero Pay, which was basically acknowledging the fact that, hey, you're kind of heroic. You're on the front lines. You're, 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 you're keeping our business viable, whether, you, whether in a distribution center, moving our product, or whether in a store selling our product. Um, and so we we distributed, you know, premium hourly pay essentially to recognize um, really these these heroes, these frontline teammates of ours. So those are some of the ways I think, you know, through the pandemic that, uh, you know, you, you talk about making deposits, right? Emotional deposits in the bank account. I think we made a lot of deposits, uh, especially when it wasn't easy to do so. Yep. Those are great examples, um, similar to what we've heard from some other organizations in completely different industries, uh, which is why I think more companies, as is shown here by the poll results, became either slightly healthier or much healthier. Yes, there's a, a healthy, uh, no pun intended, uh, group of uh, that became slightly more toxic as well, about one in four, but very few became very toxic uh, since the pandemic. So, uh, you know, it just speaks to the resiliency for those organizations that are intentional, um, uh, you know, they're focused on and on being agile and resilient. Um, I think you can, you can improve a culture even during very difficult times. So thanks everyone for participating in that poll. And Tom and, and Michael, I think um, Michael had mentioned um, you know, empl measuring employee engagement, right? And more organizations are measuring this just like we did with this poll, right? Uh, measuring aspects of their culture. And Michael, you recently um, did an overall of your overall culture survey. Can you tell us about that? What do you measure? What insights does it provide? And what actions um, have been or will you be taking as a result? Yeah. Yeah, this uh, yeah, this little undertaking. This this is this is called a first ninety day onboarding project for my new head of people analytics, Kimberly Nye, um, uh, which she did lovingly, and and she she really poured her heart and soul into, as well as her her brain. This was amazing work. Um, yeah, we've been measuring our culture now in many different ways um, through listening, you know, channels, whether that be through our formal engagement survey and then pulses throughout the year. Um, you know, we do new hire onboarding surveys at certain increments, uh, you know, in someone's journey. We also do exit surveys. So we, we have a lot of uh, various different sort of formal ways to quantitative ways to gather um, cultural cultural uh, feedback and input. Um, so, yeah, just to give a, a bit of a sense of what we did. Um, I think the, the the engagement survey, the good news is it was it was very it's very well valued here. There's a there's a, a great sort of. Um, use case for it here. People kind of believe in it. They use it. We action on it. Um, it just needed an upgrade. It needed, you know, more scientific rigor. It needed more clarity. And, and we did that. Um, you know, so for example, we, we you know, we reduced 
significantly the, the, the length of a survey, the survey by, you know, roughly 26%. Um, we kind of reduced things like cognitive load, right? So the way we worded items and looked at sort of the, the, the deep survey design elements, um, you know, blended items that were um, very highly sort of factoring on, on certain elements that we knew that we didn't need to ask this questions versus, versus that. Um, and so we really tightened this survey nicely. And, and really by doing so, what we did was um, we increased its reliability, you know, uh, quite significantly from about 0.88 to, to 0.92. We, uh, we improved our, you know, sort of output sort of predictability. Uh, you know, we consider teammate satisfaction, which is made up of engagement and commitment for us. Um, by quite a, quite a bit, and we, uh, you know, so so there are just many elements that, through sort of more scientific rigor, we we brought some, uh, we we brought a lot more uh, clarity and tightness to the survey. Uh, we also refined the model um, that we use, and you know, this sounds, I think, for many of you on the line, probably pretty basic, but just to reorganize our model and how we communicate to the organization the way we think about measuring engagement, right? So we think of it in this way, basically, we've got our five driving categories, right? The inputs, if you will, of teammate experience, you know, you know, factors about my manager, factors about the team that I work with, factors about whether I feel like I'm being grown and developed, factors about, you know, the, the, the culture more broadly. And we, we, we measure those things. Those are the things you can act upon, right? And that's how we talk about this internally. Those are the things if you're gonna action plan on manager, those are the things you do, because when you do those, we correlate those to the output measure, which is teammate satisfaction. And like I said, teammate satisfaction here is made up of both the engagement and commitment. And, you know, we know, we believe when you do certain things on that sort of experience side, it's going to increase the levels of engagement and commitment. And then when you increase engagement and commitment, we're not doing it because we, you know, we just like it. We're doing it because we know that it drives things like performance, retention, and then ultimately our athlete experience. Another another sports analogy. We call our customer athletes um, uh, because we we believe everyone has an athlete in them. Um, and so and so we we kind of draw the, the 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 red thread through for for folks to understand. Yeah, when I when I make a movement on this item about my manager it's because it's going to ultimately affect our, our, our end consumer. Um, so yeah, that's, that's a little bit of what, about what we did. I know it's a lot in the mouthful, but uh, we're, we're excited about it. We just got finished with our, our annual survey um, with where we introduced this new model, this new, new survey design. We had the, some of the highest response rates we ever had. Now think about, we had 40,000 respondents out of our population Um approaching 80% response rates, which, you know, for, for a retail environment, that's, I, I, you know, I think it's pretty, pretty laudable um, and, uh, and, and some pretty impressive results as well. So, so we're excited about it. We're still churning through some of the data, but uh, you know, we're going to keep this train rolling. Uh, we had a quick follow-up question in the chat from Kelly. Uh, you mentioned uh, satisfaction, meaning both engagement and commitment. And then she asked, how, how do you measure commitment specifically? I mean, ultimately, retention would be one aspect of being committed and staying mm -hmm. with the organization. But what are some other measurements of commitment? Yeah, typically, uh, and, and you know, I've seen, and, and certainly as we we have it in there, we, we think about commitment in terms of like a teammate's intent to stay with the organization. So we ask questions like, um, you know, do you uh, do you have plans to be working here six months from now, for example, would be a, a, an indicator of someone's commitment to the organization. So those are those are some of the the measures we we would kind of put under the commitment bucket, if that makes sense. Yeah. And then another quick question from the chat following on this engagement survey change. Can you share a bit about how you're able to share the engagement data back to your team teammates? And I heard you use the word taking action as well. Um, so how are you sharing the results back? And then do you have any examples of, of things you anticipate or that you've done in the past to take action based on the results? Yeah, uh, and, and this is a huge part of it, right? Um, you know, what we also know from the survey, which which we're not as proud of, but certainly, you know, as as my boss says, Julie, you can't fix a secret. So that's part of the reason why we do this, right? Um, and uh, we, you know, we we're very transparent with people. We we ask items like, did you did you get the results from the last survey, right? 
do you believe that action will be taken from, from the results of this survey? And we didn't get high, high marks, not certainly not anywhere nearly as high as we would like on those items. And so it, it, it was an indication to us and a wake up call to say, okay, we've really got to double down on the way we're communicating and taking action. We've had those plans in place, but um, we, we may have, it sounds like we've, we've lost a little bit of rigor on that. So, um, you know, for us, it starts from the top. Um, you know, Julie, we, you know, our board meeting was was two weeks ago. She shares these results with the board of directors for 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 the company. So, so a number one, we know that there's a tremendous amount of value and buy in that this is important for this business. Um, uh, she takes the executive leadership team through these results and, and by doing so gets their commitment to say, hey, look, this is what your teammates are saying. Your teammates are saying they don't believe you're going to do anything with this. They don't believe or they haven't seen, right? At the very least, let's share results. So so we've built mechanisms in to ensure that within the next two weeks, um, coming out of our earnings call, typically every senior leader has a town hall. So um, we have plans to make sure that every single one of our senior leaders starts with taking their functions through their functional level results. Um, and then from there, it'll be a cascade process with the with their leadership teams doing the same for their teams, et cetera. Um, so that that that's initial. And then part of that, of course, is the action side, which you asked about, uh, Tom. You know, it's embedded in that is, and, and the nice thing about these improvements we've made, we've been very clear about where to focus, right? And and tried to take the, the guessing game out of this for people. So we basically said, look, there are certain items that are highly correlated with teammate satisfaction. We're going to tell you what those are, but we're also going to tell you out of that bucket of items that are highly, highly correlated with her team. Is that what are the lowest scoring ones, right? So basically this is, this is the, um, this is the environment you should be playing in to make sure you can have the biggest impact on improving your teammate satisfaction. And so we're kind of, making it very easy for leaders to say, no, I should be working on, on this particular item to, to have the biggest impact over the next 12 months. So th those are some of the things that we're going to be focused on. And, um, and then we'll pulse throughout the year with our, our, our kind of mini surveys. Awesome. Um, Michael, I am going to switch gears on you and throw you a little bit of a curveball. You know, oh like boy. That. Okay. I threw, that, I threw that in for you. And, uh, and you so, got the baseball back there too. Exactly. So it's, it's so we're on brand. The role of um, DEIB, right, in the culture at Dix. Let's talk a, a little bit about this. You told me that it's a strength in, in your culture. So tell us about, you know, your approach through that lens. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, it's interesting the the context behind this is four years ago, roughly, DE and I as a concept didn't necessarily exist here at exporting goods. And I think you know it wasn't it's it's not because we're bad people or a bad company. It's just it it just hadn't evolved yet in in the maturity curve, right? Um, and so when when particularly when Julie, my my boss, our chief people and purpose officer, uh, came on board, um, that was one of our top priorities. Is let's let's we've got to really double down on making sure that we have this element of our culture solved for. And so we created for the first time ever a DEI office, a small but mighty team um, that um, really uh, you know has done amazing things, amazing things that has made such phenomenal progress. Also. I mean, so much so you would never know if you walked in this building or walked in any of our stores that, you know, we, we've only fully, truly been at this in a focused manner for the last four years. Um, you know, and, and you know, DE&I, their forward has really become a bedrock of, of our values and, and kind of the way we do business uh, and culture. Um, you know, whether that was the formation of, you know, our grassroots, what we call teammate resource groups, um, uh, you know, representing certain elements and certain certain facets of our, our population. Impact teams, we knew we needed kind of leadership championship at the, at the beginning. So we created what we called impact teams, which were, you know, leadership led and sponsored project teams, for lack of a better attack teams, to take on big meaty topics in the DEI space to, to accelerate um, our, our progress there. Um, and then, you know, we've implemented things that have been that have seen huge success within our population, our women's conference. In a few weeks in April here, we're about to have our 
um, second annual women's conference, um, highly like highly coveted seats at that at that conference here in Pittsburgh at our, our at our corporate office. And um, you know, what's next week we, we're continuing our speaker series. We have a DEI speaker series. We have Layla Ali, um, Muhammad Ali's daughter, coming in to be on site and talk with our, our teammates about belonging, uh, which is our theme, our DEI theme for for 2024. Um, you know, we we've 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 instituted dialogue circles. You know, you think about everything we've been through the last three, four years. Um, dialogue circles were were implemented like it probably was in many of your organizations. To ensure we had the, the the safe space for our teammates to get together and talk about all the craziness that was happening in the world, whether that be racial injustice, um, whether that be Me Too, uh, and now even even in these days, you know, talk, you know, having I was in a dialogue circle a few weeks back about the Palestine Israel uh, war. Um, so those those have been true game changers culturally for us, and then you know. Um, you know, more recent times, we've been sort of, uh, we've been talking about this concept of psychological safety across the organization as well. Um, so, so yeah, uh, it's just been a, an amazing sort of, I, I would say evolution, but it's really been a revolution in terms of the speed and acceleration it's taken across the company over the last four years. So, uh, sounds like we have, um, I'm I'm looking at time, Michael, and we have so many great things that I want to um, touch on. So, I um, came from the business, right? And I love leveraging talent as a critical enabler for the business. So, your role as chief talent officer, right, is very broad. Has TA, you know, um, L and D, you know, PM, succession, DIB, you name it, analytics, and more. So, you mentioned that a major focus for you and your team is leveraging your talent as this critical enabler for the business. Mm -hmm. Can you share some examples? Yeah, I, I just glanced over to the chat too. I saw a great question about the title, Julie's title. I'd, I'd love to just talk about that for a minute, uh, if I could. Um, Chief People and Purpose Officer. It was very intentional um, uh, a couple of years ago when that change was made. Um, you know, one of the functions that Julie um, oversees is our foundation, our, our organizational foundation, which he started in the recent few years uh, called Sports Matter. Um, we, you know, the, 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 the essential tenet of sports matter is we believe that every youth should have an opportunity to, to, to benefit from sport in their childhood. And we believe that communities and our, our society will be better when that's true. So sports matter was created essentially, um, to fund, um, community team sport or sport kind of, uh, moments out there where it's it's tougher, it's the, the funding is not there, uh, the communities need to help and support. Um, if you saw our 75 for 75 campaign over this last year, um, where we, we donated $75,000 to 75 different youth sport um, uh, sort of opportunities and needs across the country. If you get an opportunity to see some of the videos when we present the check to the, to the baseball coach or the, the volleyball coach, I mean, talk about tear jerkers. You're not going to be able to watch these things without, with you know, without crying. But, um, but that that's why that that's why we believe it's so closely connected to our culture and what we're doing as an HR organization. Uh, we talked about being the soul of the company, and so so Julie's title is people and purpose. Um, I'm glad uh, to your question, though, Mimi, on on. No, I, I'm glad you you stopped there because I thought that that was a great question. We were going to add it to the end for you. So thanks. Oh yeah. Sorry, I threw you a curveball back. So there you go, touche. <laughs> I, I can play ball. Let's go. <laughs> all right. All right. Um, yeah. So so how do we leverage talent as a critical enabler? That's one of our strategic um teammate and, and cultural uh pillars uh that you know it sits on our CEO Lauren Hobart's uh you know uh, performance objectives for the year. Um some of the ways we're doing that, um, you know, and there's a lot here. There, there's a ton, right? Um, you know, early in my tenure, you know, I think one of the first foundational steps we took was creating a leadership competency model. And I know, you know, it's kind of, you know, bread and basic stuff, motherhood and apple pie. But, you know, for us, it was a grounding to say, like, what what do we what do we believe not only as a leadership team, but also what does the data tell us that, you know, we we uh, we're focused on and building leaders in this company. You know that gave us the foundation to do things like, um, you know, launch a multi-rater feedback system, our 360 
feedback um, mechanism that you know, we're able to sort of give leaders the, the feedback they need to grow. Um, and we've we've instituted that over the, the last few years. Um, it, we've also launched, and, and again, it, it enabled us to identify the type of talent we were looking to grow and accelerate as high potentials in organization. We launched we launched our first ever executive leadership development program here at Dix um, for top leaders, um, uh, which has been which has been phenomenal. You know, and, and the way we've done that has been really um, it's a testament to how we're truly leveraging talent as a critical neighbor because we'll went through the program is not only learning, right? It's not only cool things like sending people to Harvard or Yale or to take some experiential courses, but we engage these folks in solving real business problems. We get them together for a week and we present them with some strategic conundrums for the business and say, hey, break out and work on that. We want to hear, you know, we'll bring in Lauren, we'll bring in Ed, present to us um, or debate this topic, literally get debate teams together you know, let's, you know, take the take take the anti side and take the for side and debate each other on our future. Um, and, and it's been it's been phenomenal, I think. And, and there's been so much growth out of it. It's sort of a 12, 18 month sort of program that we that we take folks through and and, you know, kind of culminates into like business simulation. So, uh, you know, how do you go through a business simulation, compete as teams and, and, and thereby continue to learn, you know, as a leader? How are you um, pulling the different levers within within a business at a higher level? So at any at any rate, so there's some of the some of the ways we're, we're leveraging talent as some of the few of many uh, ways we're leveraging, leveraging talent as a critical enabler. Nice, and talent as a cr critical enabler also um, includes you know succession processes, right? Yeah. Um, so I, I remember that you recently modified um, this. What are some of the changes that you made, and why? And what have um, the results been so far? Yeah, you know, I've been, as as many of you, again, uh, you know, the, the various forms and fashions of succession planning, um, some some done really well, some not so much. And depending on where you sit in an organization, too, it could, it could differ. Um, so this is always a, a, a learning journey. You know, we we had some opportunities uh, in the last couple of years, and you know the, these are going to sound so basic and simple, um, but you know sometimes the small changes make such a huge difference, um, and and we were pleased to see some of this. So, for example, you know when I joined, we we were still sort of very heavily using a non nine box methodology within our discussions around talent, um, which uh, you know great. Um, there's a time and there's a place for that. I think the way it had manifested itself over time here was it became a proxy for allocating sort of equity for leaders, right? And, and the conversation in talent reviews and our people succession planning sessions became so much more about, no, they're an eight box, they're a four, no, they're a four box. And it was so much of a debate and a, quite frankly, a calibration around a rating that you, you really didn't get to a conversation about the the actual succession of talent right and how you were planning for game plan and talent so we kind of stepped away from the nine box and we really focused on um operationally defining our, our potential ratings in a much more meaningful way and it's amazing with just a few tweaks to how we did that um it 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 really just like it, you know, we didn't tell leaders to do something differently. We just said, hey, here's here's how we're thinking about talent, here's how you should think about potential. Um, it, these nudges just completely changed the way people were able to have conversations because when the language changed in these talent ratings, it gave the leader the, the permission and the, the words to use to say, yeah, yeah, that's, that's kind of the role you're playing. That's how I see you, right? And so it was very natural and easy to use these, these talent ratings in a conversation with someone about or, or as a conversation about someone. Um, and, and as a result, just to look at the data, I mean, we, we, we saw a massive shift year over year on our distribution of talent ratings, you know, where I would say in, in, in an unhealthy way, we had something like above 30% of our people highlighted as top talent. Like, I, I, I don't I don't know that like true top talent, like everyone's, I think now we're probably down in the realm of anywhere from five to 15% true top talent. Um, and, and again, as, as, as many of us know, like, that's not like a calling people bad or good. It's, it's how are you going to decide to make 
the investments where you need to make the investments, right? And so, so we we feel like we've made great shifts. There's still still a long way to go, but uh, we we made some great strides in that space. And Michael, I love how you shared a little bit about that potential rating, right? Because that tells you a lot in terms of forward looking. Um, and you emphasize internal mobility at Dix, right? So what's involved in that? Do you take into consideration that, you know, potential rating? Tell us more. Yeah, we do. <clears throat> we absolutely do. I think I think this is one of the areas that we're we're trying to lean in more so and, and to really sort of plot out that internal mobility. So this is a space that we're kind of we're really doubling down on, particularly this year. Um, but, you know, you, you mentioned, uh, you know, internal mobility. Um, you know, first of all, when you talk about a retail company like ours, 95 percent of our teammate base sits out in the you know so fifty thousand teammates 90 percent of that is out in our stores and you know we hire somewhere in the realm of fifty thousand teammates per year now admittedly some of that is 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 because we turn them too fast and you know we're working on that too um but you know this is you know retail environment where you have a hiring machine right and and um uh you know we 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 focus heavily on on internal mobility and this year we have a big initiative to ensure that you know we look at that that sea of talent out there and we say gosh there there are future you know marketers there are future future you know uh hr people right um we don't do a great job of tapping into that though right and so this this is not a new concept, but certainly one that we're gonna we're gonna start to to make sense for us is this notion of an internal talent marketplace, right? And how do we treat that fifty thousand as our own campus, right? So we have great campus programs. We go we go recruit and set up shop on the top MBA schools. Uh, a lot of our top schools we do for other programs and merchandising, et cetera. You know, and typically when you do that, you have a job fair, you have a career fair, you're talking to students, you're recruiting. Um, why can't we do something similar in that vein with with our own population and treat our own sort of store base and and supply chain base as our campus essentially? So we're going to really get you know a big effort for us here in, in in the People and Purpose organization this year is going to be how do we create the mechanisms to to enable and leverage that internal talent marketplace in a much much bigger way? So it's going to be exciting. I'm I'm pretty excited about that. And I'm still stuck on some of the stats that you shared in terms of how much recruiting you have to do to continue to keep um your stores, you know, thriving. Um so yeah. I'm gonna I'm gonna throw you another one, a curveball and, and blend one because I'm looking at the time. Um so you talked a lot about your internal talent, some of that mobility. And so how are you providing learning and development opportunities? without, you know, pooling these folks off the floor. Um, you you told us a, a, a little story, but I'd love for you to share that with the folks on the call today. Yeah. And, and you know, for those of you on the call who are like shaking their heads going, oh my God, yeah, this is, this is what keeps me up. When you have a massive, you know, employee base like this, <clears throat> um, every minute of, you know, what you call unproductive time, right, in the business, um, every minute off the floor, not folding a shirt or servicing an athlete uh, is money. Um, and so it's always a real fine line and balance of how do you continue to upskill and, and, and build that capability. But And it really forces you to have a strong ROI case, essentially, to say, okay, that 15 minutes off the floor will yield you X, right? And so um, uh, we, we, you know, again, a challenge we continually uh, are, are looking to get at from different angles, um, but a huge initiative we have underway right now across the stores as we're transforming the way we do, um, we do business really is, is really upskilling, for example, our selling skills, our service orientation, right? Um, we, we, we believe that if we can create an amazing athlete experience or so through some of these amazing concepts, Tom, like, like house of sport, um, it, it's a real unlock. It's a real differentiator for us. And so um, that's hard to do, right? You've got a lot of, you've got a transient workforce, a lot of part-timers out there, a lot of, a lot of minors, you know, 16, 17 year olds are doing this as a part-time first-time gig. And um, you know, 
how do you capture that audience in the right way? One interesting experiment we're doing right now, which is su super cool, is we're partnering. We have a strategic partnership with, with um, Masterclass, who many of you are probably familiar with. Um, if, if you aren't familiar with, I, I would encourage you to be. I'm not kind of being paid for any advertisement, but um, I've been through some of the Masterclass courses, and they're just unbelievable. The content is just so fantastic, but they've curated with these, these famous athletes and actors and, and people, and they're teaching these lessons, which just are so cool. Um, we're partnering with them though, to cur they've curated their content. What they're trying to do with us is figure out how do you make this? Cause, cause masterclass has always been sort of a B to C kind of moment, right? You're like, you know, you, me, we sign on, we pay a membership and we, we do this in our personal lives. What they're trying to do is how do you build a tool for organizations to use in a relevant way like ours. So they're testing with us this, this notion of um, learning moments, you know, these sort of micro learnings in store on someone's phone. You can spend two and a half minutes watching a lesson curated specifically for this, this, this moment. And we're doing that against this selling and service uh, capability. And um, we're in the midst of the campaign right now. It's a 12, 12 week journey. I think we're in week two or three. And um, it's 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 really cool. And so we're going to measure it. We're going to see kind of sales results against control stores. I think we have 200 stores that are going through the pilot right now. Um, but uh, it's it's really neat stuff. And and um, and so yeah, it, it's just one of those ways we're constantly trying to tackle this question of how do you get the best bang for your buck with every non athlete facing minute you have with with a teammate. So more to come. Right. Well, Michael, so much great discussion today. I'm going to hand it back to Tom to wrap for us, but thank you for being with us. Yeah. Thank you, Mimi. Yeah. And thank you as well, Mimi. Great job uh, facilitating the conversation with Michael Day. I'll double down on that. Thank you, Michael, for sharing all that you did. You generated some great comments and questions from participants on the call. Um, for all of you that are still with us on the call here as we're about to wrap, just wanted to note that next practice weekly sessions, uh, as some of you know, are available for recertification credit hours with both SHRM and HRCI. So if you've got one of those certifications, I know you're always looking for research credit hours, just jot down the relevant program ID or activity ID that's here on the screen and that Zeta also provided in the chat. Uh, and one, one more time, just plugging our I4CP Next Practices Now conference. It's next week, so it might be too late to make travel plans, but there is a virtual attendance option. You'll miss out on the in-person networking, but you'll still gather all the best and next practices from this wonderful lineup of speakers that you see here. So I encourage you to check that out at I4CP.com forward slash conference. With that, I'll close things out. I hope everyone has a great rest of the week. Thanks again to Mimi, to Zeta, and to Michael. Another great event, and we'll see folks again in two weeks. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, guys.